From bloated and tired to free and inspired, welcome to Free and Inspired Radio with Philip Watkins, your weekly dose of everything digestion and mental health related. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here is your host, Philip Watkins. Yes, yes. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host, a naturopathic practitioner, Philip Watkins, and I'm grateful to have you with us today. If you're new to the show, well, the title says it all. It's all about feeling free and inspired and exploring the many different avenues you can take to get there, whether it's deep dives on digestion and mental health solutions or guests who offer their own stories and answers. I hope I can be the type of guide you can rely on to unlock the agency you have to reach your own mental and physical competency. Let's get started with what's coming up on today's episode. Coming up on this week's show. Well, episode five has rolled around, hasn't it? And today we're going to be talking about aging. The estimates on just how much the global anti-aging industry is worth currently range from $30 billion to over $100 billion US dollars. Whoa. Creams, serums, and just about anything that can be applied or ingested, most likely it seems, has some form of anti-aging potential. And obviously that comes up at a price. But in this episode, we're going to talk about another form of aging, and that's internal aging. So more importantly, we're going to be looking today at your genes and how you can use bioactive ingredients in food to express their potential to reverse aging. Yep, you might actually be able to age in reverse and enjoy delicious food in the process. Pretty sure that's Paul Rudd's secret. Shout out to Paul Rudd. We're all backing you as the sexiest man alive this year. And if you are eating food to unlock your genes, maybe you can come on the show and tell us exactly how you did it. So the most common question to start here when we're talking about aging is, isn't trying to reverse aging just a waste of time? Well, it used to be, but it seems as if these things have changed as recently as the last three years where the World Health Organization has helped catalyze a significant change in how science sees aging. It classified aging as a disease, or at least the potential cause of disease. To be more precise, the definition as per the WHO is caused by a pathological process which persistently leads to the loss of an organism's adaptation and progress in older ages. The shift in definition means that even whilst aging is still a fight against time, the process of aging relating to how it can influence the body's ability to interact with its environment could be mitigated or better still prevented. Sounds like science fiction. And I like science fiction, but not for the scientists at Harvard who have restored the vision in blind mice by reversing their biological clocks. I'm just going to say that again. Scientists at Harvard have restored the vision in blind mice by reversing their biological clocks. I've always made the joke about the fact that there are mice in labs around the world that have achieved somewhat Jesus status in the aging landscape in the sense that they've just had, you know, either just beaten what we consider to be possible in medical science, but also have just lived, you know, way longer than they're supposed to. But shout out to the mice who have had their vision brought back by these amazing scientists. This monumental feat has come about by discovering that the body somehow retains the record of its youth within the DNA. This ledger can be accessed and seemingly activated later in life to regenerate tissues. Just writing this just sounds almost inconceivable and and speaking it just as inconceivable, but it seems that our genes hold the potential to transcend what appears to be an impossible biological constraint when it comes to aging. So let's, let's explore this a little further and let's spend some time on some fundamentals in the aging space. So here's a fun fact for some perspective to get started. If we cured heart disease and cancer, we would most likely increase our life expectancy by less than five years. Let me repeat that. If we cured heart disease and cancer, we would most likely increase our life expectancy by less than five years. So that's even with the absence of two of the biggest causes of death on the globe. In contrast, if we were to reverse aging, the extension in life expectancy is estimated to be in the decades. 
With that said, it's fair to say that we've seen over the last two decades or so with the global aging population and how severe chronic degenerative illnesses can be that having a longer life may not actually be all that's cracked up to be. As an extension of this, I think if you were to interview people in the street and ask them if they'd exchange more years for the ability to live freely, I'd wager that most people would prefer fewer years in better health. What do you think about that? I think most people would choose better health and a shorter life. But hey, maybe I'm missing something there. This better health is commonly known as health span and more accurately defines the type of aging that we're looking to influence here. This health span is also where our genes come in. And to quickly understand how they help, though, a quick review of the process that processes that influence aging will definitely help. So some num- there are numerous different functions that can contribute to the aging process. And according to one of our generation's most significant researchers in biological aging, Leonard Hayflick, the common denominator that underlies all modern theories of biological aging is a change in function. Now, a quick deviation here in the sense that function is now becoming really important. Where else? Functional medicine. Okay, so now we're also seeing that function is playing a role in quite a broad amount of different landscapes of research. And the you, when I read out these theories in relation to aging, you might kind of see a functional theme there as well. So look, here's a summary of the theories that have once or you know, either at one time or another been considered to be the main cause of aging. So you have th- free radical theory or commonly known as oxidative stress brought on by oxidation, which is necessary and ordinary process in the body. Still, the byproducts of the process can leave a residual mark on the body that's akin to a form of rust. So it makes sense for aging. Immunological theory refers to the aging as a prolonged autoimmune response where the immune system slowly ages the body. Inflammation theory refers to a chronic low-grade form of inflammation that degrades the body over time. An easy way to visualize this is to imagine leaving a pot on a small flame on your stovetop and you most likely see minimal damage over a day, but if that small flame is left over time with that pot, then the pot will slowly degrade itself. Last but not least, mitochondrial theory refers to the breakdown of the ability to create energy within our cells, thus rendering it harder to fuel tissues and organs. Researchers researchers thought that these functions were mutually exclusive and independently caused aging at one point or another, but now it's agreed that they all have their part to play in the process. But what part does your DNA play in aging? Now, before we get into the answer, when discussing DNA with either patients in the clinic or anywhere else, for example, uh, like a podcast, I always like to begin with some mantras or important caveats regarding how genes influence your help to better frame things. This is incredibly important. For the sake of your time and the length of this episode, we'll just discuss two main mantras, which if you're interested in genomics or the field of study concerning the genome, you might have already come across. Now, the first mantra is genes are a tendency and not a destiny. Another particular favorite of mine from a registered dietitian, Amanda Archibald of culinary genomics fame, is one genetic mistake does not a chronic disease make? I think that's very, very elegant. A small side note on this mantra for your curiosity, this mantra perhaps best encapsulates ethical discussions around interpreting genome reports and concerns about associating, associating your DNA with disease risk. These concerns are largely around the suggestion that your genes and their associative spelling mistakes directly equal a disease outcome and whether in the case of conditions that you can't take action on, the news of these connections can cause actually more harm than good. And what do you think about that? That's an interesting ethical question there. Let's go back to the mantra. Genes offering a tendency and not a destiny directly aims to dispel this by pointing out that your genes turn a function on or off such as a protein or an enzyme. And the DNA reported back to you via mapping your genome is only referring to these functions, not to any of the diseases they may cause. 
Now, I'm trying to condense a very high, a highly complex subject here with variance, nuance, but still, the practicalities of knowing your DNA or supporting it via the diet, remember why you started listening to this, we're going to get to the food, is to mitigate deficits in function based on DNA that you've inherited from generations before you. The destiny or the disease process occurs when the deficits are left unmitigated over decades hence how we see these associations begin in the first place. Once you are aware of the unique combination of genes and the personal deficits in function intrinsic to you, modifications to your lifestyle can be made in response, increasing or beginning herbal or nutritional supplementation, for example, making dietary changes, as in the case of what we're looking at in this episode. Changes that over decades, though, shift what might seem to be a predestined outcome. These lifestyle modifications lead nicely to the Shekin mantra that refers to the influence of epigenetics or processes above the genes. The genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger is the second mantra. And I think this is a very, very important one. This second mantra holds the key to the action items we just discussed. The term environment in this statement, in this case, relates back to either an internal landscape, such as the microbiome, or external environmental elements such as pollution, stress, or even your dietary choices. These environments have the power to pull the trigger on your genes and you can be the architect of decisions that influence them all. And now we're really starting to get to the crux of what this episode is all about. Your DNA is is what it is and it always will be. Still, there are ways you can take control and behave in a manner aligned with this second mantra. But behavior aligned with one of our fundamental principles here at Philip Watkins Naturopathy, which is a personal sovereignty. Now, this action expresses what inspired me to do this episode. Hearing the words, it's just genetic, suggests that there's nothing that you can do. You've got no power. Don't get me wrong, there are some hereditary conditions where this is very much the case. But for many other conditions, especially those that affect our health span, it can seem that it seems as if, though, that's very much far from the case. What's most exciting is that through the work of people such as Amanda Archibald, who I mentioned earlier, and her genetic kitchen, the power we have to influence our health span may be highly understated and right under our noses in the form of dietary choices. Now, we're going to quick take a quick break in uh, this part of the show, and we're going to be back and with more after the break where we're going to actually get into the food. Finally, you say, I started listening to this podcast because I wanted to learn about how my food was going to help my genes, and we are going to go all into that exactly after the break. So stay with us, and we'll be back with more. Time to take a break. Are you enjoying this episode of Free and Inspired Radio? There's no better time to take back your personal health sovereignty. If you want to connect with more free and inspired episodes, simply subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or visit the website at www.philipwatkins.health for more information. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Free and Inspired Radio, episode five. We're talking about food and your genes. We're talking about how it relates to aging. In the first part of the show, we just did some basic fundamentals about genes, but also just gave you a little bit of background on exactly where the aging space is. In this section, we're going to go right into the food. So the good stuff now. So look, Bioactive ingredients from food can influence gene behavior. So what are bioactive compounds? Bioactive compounds are non-nutrient dietary components found in food. They can directly influence how genes behave and function. So just remember that second mantra there. It's important to note that they are not like vitamins or minerals such as vitamin D or calcium and offer no caloric value either. Their rise to prominence is primarily the result of studies showing the protective effects of plant-based diet on cardiovascular and cancer risk, hence all of the uh, moves to plant-based diets we see a lot from people. 
Amanda Archibald, who we've mentioned just previously, describes bioactives function as a switch that when activated sets in motion a series of biochemical steps akin to knocking over a series of dominoes. The result of this cascade is the activation and sometimes deactivation of specific genes. Very, very elegant once again. Examples of bioactives are either well-known supplements or even pharmaceutical drugs that you may have heard of before. Some of these are resveratrol from grapes, aspirin derived from willow bark, so the salicylate content from willow bark. Metformin, a very popular drug amongst the aging space, was originally derived from French lilac. Uh, Epigogalagocachetin, galate from green tea. Quercetin from fruits and allicin from garlic. Let's look at some of these genetic pathways, though, and how these foods and their consumption can influence them. So, look, we'll first hit one of my favorite pathways, which is NRF2, which is one of the key regulators for protection against oxidative stress, one of the main causes of aging. Remember the oxidative stress theory that we talked about before? Okay, so when it comes to NRF2, get ready for one of those too good to be true statements that we often hear from supplement marketeers. Ready? Okay. Raising NRF2, which regulates the action of 500 genes, no less, has been found to prevent or treat a large number of long-standing inflammatory diseases in either animals or humans. I think here comes the superlative part, including various cardiovascular, kidney, lung, autoimmune, and inflammatory bowel diseases. Does that not kind of cover pretty much all of the things that we know keep people you know, kill people regularly? I think it does. So look, NRF2 plays a very, very important role in both the generation of illness, but also in the processes that we've talked about earlier, oxidative stress, inflammation, and some of these other theories that we mentioned that have been now uh, considered to be part of the aging process. It's crazy to think that Diet can affect such a broad spectrum of influence on your genetics, but this is why diet is now considered to be one of the cornerstones of prevention and treatment in cardiovascular disease and diabetes because we're seeing that food can affect these uh, genetic pathways. Bioactive ingredients in foods that help to raise an NRF2 are as follows. Pens and paper ready. Lycopene derived from cooked tomatoes. Curcumin derived from turmeric, so fun fact, did you know that the cooking process actually enhances the compounds in turmeric? Quercetin from citrus fruits, apples, onions, parsley, sage, garlic, and olive oil. And sulforaphane from cruciferous vegetables such as kale, broccoli, and broccoli sprouts. One thing that strikes me most about this list is just how commonly occurring these foods are, but also how easy it would be just to load them up on your plate regularly. This potential backs up the simplicity of what we call nutrigenomics, the study of how specific nutrients and other non-nutritional compounds found in food activate the activity of our genes. You don't have to be a master recipe writer or someone overly committed to research to influence your genes. You just have to be consistent in choosing foods that help over a long period of time. It gets better. Welcome to another group of genes called CERT1. CERT1 genes help us to manage inflammation, control blood sugar efficiently, and in the case of fats, affect how the body metabolizes, stores, and uses fats. CERT1, or short for sirtuin one seems to be the biggest deal of all, especially regarding the longevity and health span space. And I think it's fair to say we have Dave Sinclair out of Harvard to largely thank for that. But on another side note, I remember watching a one and a half hour lecture in New York in 2019 at a conference I was at that was going into CERT1 then. So this has been bubbling away for a while. But listen, here comes another too good to be true statement. CERT1 regulates metabolism, resistance to stress, cell survival, inflammation, and immune function, and circadian rhythms, which are important and significant for stress and sleep management. Interestingly, here's something for people who are looking to manage their body composition or their weight. CERT1 plays a unique role in the body's interaction with fat, and I just mentioned that previously, but early studies have shown that it suppresses another gene called PPAR. G or PPAR gamma, which shuttles fat into storage when it's activated. In other words, CERT1 can influence fat storage and promote fat burning. 
and through getting a DNA report or the right DNA report, you can actually find out if you have PPAR gamma or not, which obviously influences this process a little bit further. Interestingly, you won't find this in the transcript, but this is why we listen to the podcast and the transcript. You can actually influence CERT1 by not eating past feeling full. Now, you'll see some areas around the world already do that as a natural tradition. The Japanese, the French, for example, will only eat until they're full and they won't uh, overeat, so to speak. Now, overeating actually suppresses CERT1. So this is one of the kind of cool things that come out of people's lifestyle habits or these traditional habits that we can then kind of explain with science, which is really cool. Bioactive ingredients in foods that influence CERT1 as well as not overeating are as follows. So resveratrol from red wine, so popular supplement as well. Uh, Quercetin, so foods uh, for NRF2, so remember them. Curcumin derived from turmeric. Berberine, which is from many commonly used herbs in natural medicine, such as uh, barberry, philodendron, and coptis. And physetin, which is a compound found in persimmons and strawberries, which I believe, and if you want to correct me if I'm wrong, is actually responsible for the pigment in strawberries as well. I could be wrong for that. So what do you think? We've only brushed the surface here, but to wrap up, it's clear that essential foods such as garlic, strawberries, tomatoes, and olive oil can unlock your body's ability to pay significant transactions while promoting critical gene influences such as CERT1 and NRF2. The crazy thing is, it's just not that hard. See any overlap between the bioactive ingredients for CERT1 and NRF2? Yep, you got it. Quercetin and curcumin both affect CERT1 and NRF2 two critical genomic factors that regulate all aging processes that we've discussed in this article. This combination is a fantastic example of how natural medicine compounds that have a wide-ranging effect on the body, not just acutely for therapy, but over the long term, and spending time focusing on the right foods can unlock more value for each food that you eat and pay the body's transactions regardless of your genes. Better still, and once again, if you know me well enough, this is what I love. You're in control. It's your agency, your sovereignty. Now, we haven't even touched on supplements yet. Obviously, within the aging space, supplements are a big deal. Things like NMN, berberine. So if you'd like me to do another episode going into the supplement side of things for your genes, and as I said, there are a lot of other supplements, just leave me a comment and a kind review, and I'll make that happen for you. Before we finish this episode of Free and Inspired Radio, if you would love to hear more from me and hear about new articles, podcast episodes and more, just jump over to the website philipwatkins.health and join our community there. You'll be able to see the transcript for this show as well as the at the same place. And in the meantime, I thank you very much for getting this far in the podcast. I hope these podcasts are helping. If they're not, or if they are, just let me know in the comments of wherever you're watching this. You can go to Apple, Spotify, or YouTube as well if you prefer to do your podcast consumptions via YouTube. YouTube channel is free and inspired radio. Leave me a comment there and let me know what you think of these podcasts because it's important that you're actually getting what you want from these. I can change things up. I'm very interested to make sure that this is going to the right place and making sure that I'm solving some problems for you. I bid you farewell. Until next week, friends, have a lovely, lovely week. You made it to the end. This show is all about you, and we hope you finished this episode feeling one step closer to feeling free and inspired. We'll be back next week, but if you want to know more about Philip, please catch a digital flight to www.philipwatkins.health for further details about how we might be able to help. In the meantime, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and we'll see you for another episode next week.